Okay. Well, we're in part two of the Easter story, what really happened. And this is, all that's gone before is really just preparation for this particular session. And we really need to encourage everyone to read all four Gospels on all the topics that we've mentioned before. But we're going to focus in this uh, session on Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20 and 21. And we'll also take a look at 1 Corinthians 15 when, we're, when we get through all of that. But the final week, of course, is the triumphal entry, all the discourse, last Seder, crucifixion, resurrection, as recorded in the four Gospels. And of course, we're going to focus on just the last of each of these. But I really want to encourage each of you to read the preceding chapters, as indicated, to really get the full picture as the Easter season, as we call it, uh, continues. And uh, now the order of events are very confusing that morning. And this is one reconciliation of several accounts that are hard to reconcile unless you do a careful study. The order of events, three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, start for the sepulcher, followed by the other women bearing spices. Three find the stone rolled away, and Mary Magdalene then goes to tell the disciples. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, draws nearer the tomb, sees the angel of the Lord, this is the Matthew account, picks that up. She goes back to meet the other women following with the spices. Got it so far. Meanwhile, Peter and John, alerted by Mary Magdalene, they run and they arrive, look in, and they go away. Mary Magdalene returns, weeping, sees the two angels, then Jesus, then goes as he bade her to tell the disciples. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, meanwhile, was met, has met the women with the spices, and returning with them, they see the two angels. They also receive the angelic message, and going to seek the disciples are met by Jesus. So that's a quick snapshot of some confusing encounters. Matthew 28, at, in the end of the Sabbaths, that word is plural. It's not so in your English Bible, but it should be. It is in the Greek. As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary, Magdalene, and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Notice the plural, that's important. It's a noun plural, sabaton. Sunday, we often call the Lord's Day in honor of His resurrection. I want you to understand that the seventh day it was ordained in Eden in Genesis 2. It was observed as Shabbat before the giving of the law. Because it was ordained in Genesis 2, the law was given in Exodus 20. They did not gather manna on Shabbat in Exodus 16. That's four chapters before the law was given. I want you to understand that Shabbat is not just a Jewish thing. It becomes idiomatic of the Jewish people, of course. The law was given at Mount Sinai in Exodus 20. The Antichrist will seek to change the times and the laws, Dan warns us. So let's be aware of that. It's interesting how calendars, especially in Europe, takes Monday as the first day of the week and make Sunday the seventh day of the week. That's not biblical. Monday is not the first day of the week, neither is Sunday the seventh, but that's again Satan's attempt to obscure the reality. Monday is not the first day of the week, nor is Sunday the seventh. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, and that is referring to what we call Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week, as the Bible clearly denotes, as early as the book of Genesis chapter 2. And uh, it's interesting that throughout the Bible, we are admonished, do not move the ancient landmarks. And most of us regard that as simply property issues. No, the rabbis feel that that's an admonition not to change God's landmarks, which includes his calendar. You don't diddle with God's calendar. The millennial temple, we discover, in the future, will only be open on Shabbat and the new moon. It won't be open on Sunday. That's kind of interesting. Anyway, let's move on. John 20. For the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith him, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. They're shook up, obviously. Came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. It's always two. See, it's two witnesses. It's, 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 it's at, the, at the resurrection, it's at the ascension, there's always two. 
And as they were afraid, they bowed down their faces to the earth, and they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must first be delivered unto the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulcher, and told all these things unto the eleven, obviously Judas is not with them, and uh, to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. This is the Matthew account in chapter 28. His countenance was like lightning, his rain was white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, he is risen. And he said, as he said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring the disciples' word. Can you imagine their confusion? Excited on the one hand, and yet astonished at what's going on. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. It's interesting that he meets them back in Galilee. That was his base of operations. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Persuade, of course. The word persuade really means bribe. And... Um, now, if his body was stolen by his either his friends or either by his friends or his enemies, his friends could not have done it since they had left the scene and were convinced that Jesus was dead. His enemies could not steal his body because belief in his resurrection was what they were trying to prevent. And so, can you imagine that the authorities, both Jewish and Romans, would have given anything to get their hands on that body somehow? Peter and John raced to the tomb to inspect for themselves. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple came to the sepulcher. They ran both together, but the other disciple did outrun Peter. This is a little, little pride of John showing. He doesn't mention his face, but it's obvious John's talking about himself. He beat, he beat uh, Peter to the tomb and came first to the sepulcher. And stooping down, looking in, he saw the linen clothes lying, yet went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. And for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise from the dead. See, only the women got this. And his enemies got this. Somehow the disciples didn't get it. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. They said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Why seekest thou? Well, whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him from hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Can you picture that? Jesus said unto him, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not. Actually, what he says, Don't cling to me. Apparently had a death grip on his ankles. Do not cling to me, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, your Father, and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. So let's now shift. That's the morning events. Pretty impacting. 
Let's take a look at what happens that afternoon. Let's go to the Luke account here. Behold, two of them that went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And for those of you that don't play the horses, that's about seven miles, okay? And they talked together of all these things which had happened. It came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. I have no idea what that means, but whatever it is, it's relieved by verse 31. So for some reason, they didn't recognize who he was. And if you want proof that Jesus has a sense of humor, just watch the following conversation. He's, walk, he's walking as a stranger with these two guys. And he said to them, What manner of communications are these that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? In other words, what's bothering you guys? Huh? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said to him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Notice what Jesus says to them. I, I love this. He apparently, with a straight face, says, What things? He's been arrested at night, gone through six trials, been abused, so he's beat up so badly that Isaiah says he hardly looks human, gets crucified, dead, buried, raises from the dead, and he says, what things? <laughs> I think that's a great one. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which is a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. And we trust that it had been he that which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women of our also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came and saying they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. So they give him a praise of their, their understanding of what happened. And I love what Jesus says to him. And they still don't get who he is yet. He said to them, O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and, and, and to enter into his glory? Notice he speaks of himself in the third person. Ought not that guy, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to su enter into his glory? And then get this, this great line. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets... He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He gave them a seven-mile Bible study, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Who wrote the book? Who wrote the Torah? Moses. How do I know? Jesus said so. Throw away all that nonsense about the, the documentary hypothesis. Forget all that foolishness. They drew nigh to the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. They forced him to stay for dinner, right? And it came to pass, as he sat with, at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. That's strange. He's the guest. That was the job of the host. No, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And we're going to discover they're going to head to the upper room later that night, and they'll tell their buddies, that they recognized him by the breaking of the bread. What do you suppose he saw, they saw when he broke the bread? The nail prints in his hands. Exactly. And we get to verse 31. Their eyes were opened that they knew him, and he then <laughs> did a dirty trick. <laughs> he vanished out of their sight. He apparently can come and go as he pleases. That's fascinating. We'll talk about that in a minute. And he said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, while he opened to us the Scriptures? Can you imagine having the Lord himself give you a Bible study for seven miles? Well, that, that's the late afternoon. We get to that evening. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, went seven miles back, and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. So that's apparently a clue of how they recognized who he was. Lord is risen. And he apparently appeared to Simon. So he made a, he made a special appearance to Peter. That's allu alluded to in a couple of places. And how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. And as they, as they thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. 
He said, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. He's physical. You can handle, he's physical. And yet, he can materialize and dematerialize at will, which means that's a, it's hyperdimensional. He has a dimensionality that exceeds the three dimensions that we're familiar with. We'll talk about that later. Behold my hands and feet, that is I myself, handle me and see, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said to them, have ye any meat? I love this. He never appears after his resurrection without eating. My kind of guy. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, this is the next day, obviously, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands this print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's why we call him Doubting Thomas, right? Well, eight days later, so that would be what? That would be a Monday? A week? And after eight days again, the disciples were within and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it in my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. There's a verse in Zechariah that I tried to memorize. The more I tried to memorize, it didn't make sense. It says, One shall say to him, What are these wounds in thy hands? And then shall he answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I said, wow, there's a prophecy. I want to memorize that. And I tried to memorize it. It didn't make sense. The more I read it, the less sense it made. What are these wounds? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I could not picture a bunch of Roman soldiers driving nails through his wrists on the, into some 12 by 12s or whatever they were as being in the house of his friends. It wasn't until I reread the Thomas account that I realized what wounded him was not the nails. It was Thomas's unbelief. Ooh. You said unto Thomas, Because thou hast seen me and hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, John says, are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Praise God. We get to chapter 12, 21. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now we're up in Galilee later, right? And on this wise he showed himself. They were together, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two more of his disciples. Simon Peter saith to them, I go fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately that they might be, but the, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but his, the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Well, sure, it's a foggy morning, it's quite a distance. They see him on the shore. He said unto them, Children, do you have any meat? He said, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast, therefore, now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of the fishes. John remembers this happened earlier in the ministry. He realizes that guy on the coat on the shore is Jesus. And he's that disciple whom Jesus loves, saith unto Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat about him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but, it, it, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with the fishes. And as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus had breakfast ready, bread and, and, and a fish. And Jesus said, and Bring of the fish which ye now have caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land of the great fishes, 153, for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And the libraries are full of speculations of why 153 fish. And there's no less than 18 different theories, none of which make any real sense, ever since Jerome on. But there are a few observations. Their net was effectual. It didn't break. Each was counted. All were great, megas is the term used, none were lost, and maybe the idiom here is fishers of men, that it'll be effectual, everyone's going to count, and uh, there'll be a lot of them, and none will be lost. But anyway, let's move on. Jesus said unto them, come and dine. And next is the sentence that puzzles me, and we'll talk about that um, 
When I get to heaven, I want to ask John, what did he mean by verse 12? And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. What does that sentence mean? I have no idea. It's one of those sentences that seems to create doubt rather than answer a question. You're driving to a social engagement an hour from your home with your wife. And you're halfway there, half an hour's gone by, you say, did you remember to turn off the stove? Your wife says, yeah, I remembered. You have no problem. You keep driving. But what if she says, I'm sure I did. What do you do with that? That's one of those responses that creates a doubt where there wasn't before. What? None of the disciples dared ask him, who art thou, knowing it was the Lord? And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. And when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He says to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? See, he recognized the symmetry. He denied him three times. Jesus was giving him a chance to reaffirm three times. He said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, there is some subtleties here because Jesus used the term agapeo, which means be totally committed to. And Peter always answers phileo, to approve of, like sanction. It's a, it's a less intensive term. It's affectionately, kindly, welcome, friendly kind of thing. The third question, the third time Jesus asks us, he uses phileo rather than agape, meeting him on his level, so to speak. But um, so agape is to love, to be wholly committed, phileo to be fond of it or to be friend. Okay. But then he, Jesus goes on, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And this he spake, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith to him, Follow me. And according to Tertullian and Zibius, uh, Peter was crucified in Rome about 67 or 68, and by his own request, crucified upside down, because he didn't feel he was worthy to be crucified like Christ. And so, at least so the church tradition goes. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter saith, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? In other words, he's wondering, what's John's future? Right? Jesus said to him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. He doesn't say that he will live that long. He's just saying it's none of your business. And John is the one that dies a natural death, the only one of the bunch that does. There is a legend that they tried to boil him in oil and it didn't work, so they turned him loose. But that's, you know, church legends, who knows? Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him that he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So John himself feels necessary to explain that because even when he's writing his gospel, that rumor is going around. He's, putting it to, he's trying to kill off that rumor. This is the disciple which testified of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are many, also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written... Every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So ends John's Gospel. Now, in, the, in Matthew's account of the same period, he says, The eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, and some doubted. Then Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Luke's wrap up. They said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, and in the Psalms. Notice that Psalms is a book of prophecy. And concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. 
And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with the uh, power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he departed from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. That's Luke volume 1, setting up the sequel volume, Luke volume 2, which we call the book of Acts, which describes that in more detail. Sunday morning, just to recount that complication. Three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, Mother James, Salome, start for the sepulcher, followed by other women bearing their spices. Three find the stone rolled away, and Mary Magdalene goes to tell the disciples. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, draws nearer the tomb, sees the angel of the Lord, then go back to meet the other women that were coming with the spices. Meanwhile, Peter and John, alerted by Mary Magdalene, arrive, look in, and they go away. Mary Magdalene returns, weeping, sees the two angels, and then Jesus, then goes, and he bade her to tell the disciples. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, meanwhile, has met the women with the spices, and returning with them, they see the two angels, they also received the angelic message and going to seek the disciples are met by Jesus. This is at least one attempt to try to reconcile these confusing accounts that are uh, scattered among the four Gospels. There are subsequent appearances that we haven't gotten into. The two on Emmaus Road we did mention. Peter sometime that day is mentioned in Luke 24 and it's also alluded to in 1 Cor uh, Corinthians 15. There were 10 that night. That's without Thomas. We saw that. 11, 8 days later. That's with Thomas. We've looked at those. Seven at the Galilean breakfast that we've just looked at, John 21. There are 11 in Galilee that Matthew talks about in the mountain. There are 500 in Galilee that's recorded by Paul in the first letter to Corinthians because some of them are present in that church that he writes the letter to. He says, some of you remember. In other words, of the 500, there's some there. James, who is a brother, half-brother, if you will, of Christ, becomes a believer after the resurrection. In fact, rises to be a major leader in Jerusalem. And that's also alluded to in 1 Corinthians 15. There are many at the ascension, Luke records. And uh, Paul saw him on the Damascus Road in Acts 9. Stephen, when he is stoned, sees him in Acts 7. Paul in the temple has an encounter in Acts 22. And John on the island of Patmos, of course, in, it constitutes the first chapter of the book of Revelation. So those are some things. What's significant about the resurrection? We can't overemphasize too much. First of all, it proves that Jesus is God's son. And he makes that point in John 10. It verifies the truth of Scripture, predicted it, and it's happened, as Psalm 16 and Psalm 110 underscore. If the body had been stolen by enemies, they would have produced it. One day they were discouraged and hiding in defeat. The next day they were declaring his resurrection and walking in joyful victory. Understand the, tradition, the, the switch that took place. They were terrified, weak need terrified of the mess they're in. And then in one day, suddenly, they are allowing themselves to be tortured to the death, never changing their story. That speaks volumes. They were willing to die for the truth of the resurrection. That's all they had to do was to die and say, maybe it didn't happen, whatever. It would have spared their, their, their agony. The significance of this resurrection is that it assures our future resurrection. First Thessalonians 4 will emphasize that. It's also proof of a future judgment, as Acts 17 will detail. It's the basis for Christ's heavenly priesthood. It also gives power for Christian living. We're empowered because of that, as Romans 6 will hammer away. And it also assures our future inheritance, if in fact we don't blow it for some reason. Well, their prophecy, something else is interesting to summarize are the prophecies. There's over 300 prophecies that impact his first coming, just the few that are confirmed about the final week. He'd make a triumphal entry in Zechariah 9.9 and Psalm 118. He'd be smitten like a shepherd, Zechariah 13. He'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, as we detailed. He would be given vinegar and gall in Psalm 69. They would cast lots for his garments, Psalm 22.18. We looked at that. His bones would not be broken, scattered all through the Old Testament. His side would be pierced, Zechariah and Psalm 22 talk about. He would die among malefactors, Isaiah 53. His dying words were foretold in Psalm 22. He would be, it both opens and closes with his words. He would be buried by a rich man in Isaiah 53. He would rise on the third day. That's all through the scriptures, not only in Jonah, but Exodus, uh, Genesis 22 
uh, modified by Hebrews 11.19, highlight that. His resurrection would be followed by the destruction of Jerusalem, as Daniel rec recounts in three different chapters. And Jesus himself confirms in Luke 21 that 38 years later that would happen. Let's take a look at one epistle for reasons that are so crucial. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul, I think, would argue is the most important chapter in the Bible for you and I practically. Why do I say that? Let's hear what Paul says. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. We use that term, sir. What is the gospel? Good news. Yeah, that's a cliche. What is the gospel? Paul here defines it for us. I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Apparently you can believe in vain. Think about that. But here's the definition. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That He was buried, that He rose again a third day according to the Scriptures. Three things. He didn't just disappear, He died. And He didn't just die, He died fulfilling a large number of specific specifications. And He died in our place. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's crucial. It's astonishing how many churches will not preach the blood of Christ from a pulpit. That's what it's really all about. And that he was buried. Only Paul emphasizes burial because he builds a baptismal case out of that. And then he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And a great challenge to the student of the Scriptures is show me in the Old Testament where it predicts that he would rise on the third day. And there are at least three places. I'll let you find them. And he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, and that he was seen of the five, above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. In other words, of that 500, some died, but the some are still here among us. After that, he was seen of James, and that's the brother of Christ, and then of all the... Can you imagine James? He grew up with him. He knew his, his body language. May not take him seriously. He was a half-brother that was reputed in his hometown to be illegitimate, whatever. Yet, when he realizes after the resurrection who he is, he becomes a major leader in the early church. And the author, in fact, two of his brothers are authors of uh, books in the, in the New Testament. And then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, Paul speaking, as of one born out of time. He's, talking, he's speaking of the Damascus Road experience. For I am least of the apostles, and not me to be called apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and, by, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain. Heavy stuff, gang. Heavy stuff. Yea, and we found false witnesses of God, because ye have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that he dead rise not. And if the dead rise not, then is not Christ reigned. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ, perished. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. In fact, on the very feast of first fruits. That's all tied together. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, and in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Jesus' commitment is to straighten out the whole mess that has come in the creation because of sin. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Why stand ye in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. 
If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except to die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of weed or some other grain. But God giveth it a body, as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit there was not first that which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And is heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So in this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, Im unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not vain in the Lord. There's a couple of other issues we'll try to squeeze in here. I want to give you a quick glimpse of a passage in Mark. Mark's last 12 verses deal with the post-resurrection appearances. Some people say it was added later. We'll talk about that. I want to share with you a lingering mystery about the whole thing. And let's talk a little bit about the technology of resurrection, how it might take place. Last 12 verses of Mark. The Alexandrian codices have cast doubt about that some people, some of your Bibles say, or footnotes say these were added later. That's wrong. Westcott and Hort were not believers. And they, they were Gnostics, and they expurgated the text, and the Gnostics did that. These verses in Mark were quoted by Irenaeus and Hippolytus several centuries before the Alexandrian codices. So we know they were in the originals. They weren't added later, they were removed in the subsequent manuscripts. They are authenticated, however, by heptatic structures. I want to share with you just quickly about the heptatic structures. There are over 35 sevenfold constraints on the Greek text itself. And this defies replication even with computer assistance. The last 12 verses of Mark. The number of words are 175, which is a multiple of seven exactly. The, the vocabulary involved is a multiple of seven exactly. The letters involved are a number of seven exactly. The vowels are, number, are, are multiple of seven exactly. The consonants are a multiple of seven exactly. These are heptatic constraints. Of that total vocabulary, there were, uh, the ones that are found before in Mark are uh, heptatically constrained. Only here, those that are used in the Lord's address, not part of his vocabulary. You would go on and on and on like this. Would you like to try to do this manually? If you have, if you have just nine of, nine of these constraints, you've got one chance in 40 million of having that come out by randomness. Let's, let's assume that you could write Greek and you're going to try and make, contrive uh, 12 verses of Mark. Working eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, assuming that you have 2,000 hours per year, that gives you 120,000 minutes per year. If you have seven or nine chances, if, by randomly, it'll take 40 million attempts. 
If you do 10 minutes per attempt, it'll only take you 3,300 years to randomly try this till it works out, okay? Assuming you can do that. But it gets worse, a lot worse. If you take the structure of these texts, by appearance to Mary, the subsequent appearances, and the conclusion, or if you break it down a different way, the simple narrative, the Christ discourse, last thing, there's, these are natural divisions. You can go through and find these same kinds of constraints with each subsection we're dealing with. I won't take you through them all here. Not only that, the Greek has numerical, Greek and Hebrew have numerical values for the alphabet. It's unique in that regard. And that gives you numerical values for the words. If you go through the numerical value of all the words, in these various categories. They're always a multiple of seven exactly. Let me tell you, that's a trick. That's tough. And uh, if you go through the vocabulary, again, you find the numerical values and what have you. So again, I won't take you through each one. The, n the point is, by the time you go through this, you've got 34 constraints for a random con con confluence of those 35 constraints. It, it takes a big, big big number. Now, there's, this turns out to be 5 times 10 with 28 zeros after it. To try that many, we'll give you a computer. In fact, see there's about 3 times 10 to the 7th seconds per year. Let's assume you've got a supercomputer that, that will try 400 million tries per second. Okay, how many computers do you need to get 5 times 10 to the 28th operating at that speed? Well, at uh, 4 times 10 to the 8th tries per second, it would take about 4 times 10, 10, uh, 10 to the 12th computer years. Or putting it another way, if you had 1 million of those supercomputers, it would take you 4 million years to come up with that by a random process alone. So you've got a security system working on the text that's absolutely awesome. And that's only with 34 distinctive heptatic structures Ivan Pannon has identified 75 of those. Let's talk about a more practical issue, the lingering mystery. I really puzzled me. Why is it that they all seem to have trouble recognizing Jesus after his resurrection? Why wasn't he recognized? We see Mary in the garden, thinking he's the gardener. We see on the Maus Road, they go seven miles, they don't recognize him for some reason. Then in the upper room, they're terrified. That's understandable, but... What's bothering them? Why are they, you can understand why they're surprised. Why are they frightened? And by the Sea of Galilee, that strange breakfast that we encountered. There on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus said, I'm coming and dying. None of the disciples dared ask him, who art thou? Knowing it was the Lord. Something's going on. Every one of these cases, we seem to, there seems to be the hint that there's something going on here. Well, if, if prophecy is true, we have the Old Testament description. Psalm 22 describes the crucifixion. Isaiah 53 describes the crucifixion. Isaiah 52, 14, just before Isaiah 53, there's a, there is an issue that comes up just before 53 starts. Says, Many were astonished that his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. What that should read in pro proper translation, so marred from the form of man was his aspect that his appearance was not that of a son of a man. And uh, so if we take prophecies, there may be details recorded in the Old Testament that aren't recorded in the New. So marred from the form of man was aspect that his appearance was not. He was so tortured, he no longer looked human. That's really what the prophet is predicting. Well, if we take prophecies seriously, are there other details in the Old Testament that are not noted in the New Testament? There's one that I want to take a look at. And that's Isaiah 50, verse 6. In Isaiah 50, it says, I give my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. If this is a prophecy of Christ and if it's fulfilled, that implies to me that among other things, his tormentors, apparently ripped off his beard. Now we know that in his resurrection body he still bears his scars. He has the nail prints in his wrists, right? It's possible that his confidants, his, the women and the disciples were used to seeing a fully bearded prophet. And now they're confronted with a stranger that has scar tissue on his face where a beard used to be. Is that possible? Isaiah, Zechariah 12.10 in the Hebrew says, And they shall look upon me whom they've pierced. And there's an untranslated pair of letters between 
the me and the whom, the Aleph and the Tau, which in the Greek would be the Alpha and the Omega. Um, they shall look upon me, the Aleph and the Tau, whom they pierced. But Revelation 5, 6 gives another clue that's disturbing. In Revelation, we see John is treated to a vision of the throne of God. He says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood the Lamb as it had been slain. Apparently, Jesus will appear there in his resurrection body. And uh, this reminds me of a strange story. There's a woman that had a very disfigured face and was raising a little girl. When the little girl was very small and going to school, the kids would make fun of her because of her disfigured mother. She often came home from school crying because the kids were teasing her about that. When the little, when the little girl became old enough, the mother explained to the little girl that when she was a baby, there was a dreadful fire in the apartment. She was able to save the little girl, but sustained very serious burns in doing so. And from that day on, the little girl was no longer embarrassed by her mother. In fact, every time she looked at her face, she knew how much she was loved. And I wonder, I ponder, is it possible that Jesus today still bears the nail prints in his wrists? Is it possible that he also still bears the scars of that abuse? Because the scars of his humiliation would be also the marks of his glory on our behalf. And just maybe every time we look into his face, we'll realize how much we loved. Let's shift gears and talk a little bit about the technology of resurrection. And I'm indebted to Michael Crichton and his novel, science fiction novel called Jurassic Park. Because there's an insight there that I think can be useful for all of us. The plot line, as you may recall, involves a mosquito, a prehistoric mosquito, presumably taking a bite out of a dinosaur. That mosquito gets him cased in amber, which seals him off for thousands and thousands of years. And uh, the plot line involves finding such a mosquito and extracting from the mosquito the DNA of the blood that he took out of a dinosaur. And from that DNA, being able to reproduce the living creatures that make up the story. Now, obviously, it's just a science fiction story, but it's very provocative because there are very few little bridges left to be built to allow this to happen. If you could get the DNA of the dinosaur, presumably there are mechanisms by which you might create the creature. There's a lesson in that for all of us, you see, because all atoms and molecules are fungible raw materials. Oxygen atoms, hydrogen atoms, carbon atoms are fungible. And the molecules that make up your body are made up from an alphabet of fungible materials. So all that is necessary to resurrect you is some DNA, and maybe a little bit more, from the of the original creature. And, that, and by having that information, one can then assemble the molecules, the proteins, and the rest of it that create the creature. That's what happens in, that's what we now understand from microbiology. It's all encoded in the DNA. But there's another issue here besides that. And that's the nature of reality itself and the dimensions involved. If we think of mankind and take size going from left to right, on the big side, in the large size, we get into the universe itself, which is not infinite. It's finite. We know today from astronomy and astrophysics that our universe has a limit in size. Maybe very big, but it has a limit. We call that the macrocosm. That's what cosmology tends to deal with. If we go the other way and look at smallness, we discover the shocking discovery of quantum physics and subatomic particles is that everything we know is made up of units that can't be divided, indivisible units. That's why they call it quantum physics, the microcosm. Well, it turns out that as we absorb what we now have discovered about our reality, we discover that we are in a digital simulation that uh, things seem solid because of electrical collisions between molecules that they themselves are made up of indivisible particles. It's as if there is a larger reality beyond the one that we can experience. In fact, in Scientific American, in June of 2005, there was an article about the constants of physics. And the conclusion, or the inference of the article, is that if the constants are changing, there seems to be evidence that they are, that implies that our universe, as we know it, is but a shadow 
of a larger reality. That caught my eye because that's exactly what the Bible has been saying all along. And when you see, when you see Jesus move in and out of three-dimensional spaces and still being physical, it raises those issues. Paul in Ephesians 3 details something for us that we may miss unless we read carefully. In Ephesians, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that, he, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. You, did you pick that up? The breadth, the length, depth, and height. Those are four Greek words, one of which can, re can refer to time. How many dimensions is Paul assuming? Four. And the great discovery today, thanks to Dr. Einstein, is that we don't live in three dimensions, we live in four. Three spatial dimensions and, and time, this peculiar one that's irreversible, goes in one direction. John gives us a physics statement that many people miss. In 1 John, his first letter, epistle, 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, unless you've had some training in physics and, and uh, hyperspaces, you may miss what that's saying. We're not going to see a reduced representation. If I take a picture of you, I end up with a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional person. Right? What he's saying, we're not going to have a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional person, or whatever. Whatever dimensions he has, we shall be like him for... We shall see him as he is. To someone that understands hyperspaces, that's telling us this peculiar existence which he enjoys. He obviously has more than three dimensions. Some mathematicians speculate, maybe 11 at least, that he can get in and out of a three-dimensional space without penetrating any of the six sides. That implies hyperspace capability. Whatever that is, and he's physical. He's not, he's not transparent or, you know, he's, he's tangible. Handle me and see. Whatever that is, we're going to be like that, John tells us. We know that when he shall appear, see, he does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, we know that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We'll enjoy the same dimensionality. That's a pretty terrific thing. See, hyperdimensional travel implies you can take a six-sided space, which we might call a cube, and he can enter and leave at will, without penetrating one of those six sides. You and I can't visualize that because we're programmed for three, dimensional, three spatial dimensions. But let's talk a little bit further about architectural analysis. You know, we have a computer up here which has hardware, microcircuits, memory, wires, all that physical stuff, right? But inside the computer is software. There's a user interface, there's internal interfaces, there's machine language and algorithms, all these software things. What determines the behavior of this computer is not the hardware. That's simply an environment within which the software operates. Its behavior is totally dependent on the software, not the hardware. Now, here's, here's a model of some hardware. We'll let that box up there with a switch on it represent man, and we'll let this one represent woman. And I thought you'd enjoy that, you know. One's a little more complicated than the other. In architecture, the hardware can be analogous to our physical body, our flesh, our bones, our circulatory system, and what have you. But my problem today is I can't see you. I can only see the physical residence you happen to be in at the moment. The real you is software, not hardware. Call it soul, spirit, mind, whatever. That's vocabulary. But it's describing, describing software, not hardware. Your hardware is simply the residence that that software operates in at the moment. But software has some peculiar characteristics we want to understand. Software has no mass. If I had a blank diskette up here on the platform, and I put it on a postal scale, and it's blank, it weighs about seven-tenths of an ounce. If I spend hundreds of dollars and load that diskette with a million bytes of software and put it on postal scale, what will it weigh? It'll weigh the same thing because the software has no mass. A light switch that's on or off weighs the same whether it's on or off. It stores a one or a zero, but it doesn't change the weight. Software has no mass. In fact, I can send software through the airwaves from one computer to another, right? Software has no mass. Well, we know from Einstein's theory of relativity that time is a physical property. Time varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity. That means if you have something that has no mass, it has no time. 
And every one of you out there is eternal, whether you like it or not. The real problem is where you're going to spend it. The real you is software, not hardware. You have no, the real you has no mass. Now, our physical environment may have a little too much mass, but that's a different issue. You are eternal whether you're saved or not. So, here we are. Behind us are them that have passed away in the past. Here we are. There was a person that entered time for all of us back then and paid our price for us. And because he entered time, he made it possible for all of us to be with him in eternity. And that's why I think Salvador Dali was far more perceptive than we have any idea. Because a, there, you all know what a three-dimensional cube looks like. There is a thing called a four-dimensional cube. And if you unravel a four-dimensional cube into three-dimensional space, you get what's called a Hinton cube or a tesseract. And that's what he chose to represent the cross with. It in, it's his way. It's a mathematician's way of indicating that this whole thing is a hyperspace issue. It's, he did not solve eternity for all of us in three hours on that cross. Far deeper, far more complex than I think we'll spend an eternity discovering what it really cost him so that you and I might live. Well, we've been through the whole pretty much uh, rather hurried trip through the final week, through the Last Supper and the crucifixion and the women spices and so forth. But the key thing is Sunday morning that there's an empty tomb that certifies that his, his uh, sacrifice was accepted in the beloved. That's why we have life, because what he did for us.